Praise God. Lord Jesus, bless the eyes and ears of the listeners. And I plead your blood on this lesson in the name of Jesus that it'll reach the ears of those who earnestly desire to grow in your word, Father, and help it to uh, help them grow in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Flip your Bible. I'll be doing videos all day, y'all, because as I study, I'm going to bring y'all into it. Uh, Revelation 3, 15 through 6. Make that your memory verse. These two verses, these few verses right here. 15 through 16. I know your works. This is God talking to you. I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So what it's saying there is there's nothing worse, y'all, than a lukewarm Christian. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. A Christian who has one foot over here in sin, giving their life to Jesus, but still living in sin, still thinking sinful things, talking sinful ways, but, but yet calling yourself a Christian, maybe reading the Bible every now and then, thinking that, that's not, that, that, that you're uh, born again. So he said, uh, you can't even enjoy the peace and, and joy of God's kingdom because you feel so guilty about your sin. You can't even have a good time sinning because it's, it's eating you up. So the Bible says Christians are useless. Those kinds of Christians that live like that are useless spiritually. All right, Jesus tells us to choose whom we're going to serve and quit playing games. Now, if you go down to 320, behold, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Okay. Jesus is standing at the door of every single person waiting to be invited in to have a close relationship. If Jesus seems so far away from you, it's because you have chosen to keep him at a distance. All right. God wants to be your Lord and your closest friend. But sometimes people keep him at a distance or totally shut the door in his face because we're too busy with other things to sit down and spend an hour or two a day with just him. Too busy. Too much going to and fro in the body of Christ, y'all. Believers in Christ should never, ever leave Jesus outside with the door shut. Never. I told you, he showed me, y'all. In the future, when he comes, he's going to have to do me a crowd of people that have done this to him. A whole bunch of them are going to be believers that have one foot in the world, one foot in the church. Okay, he's going to turn his uh, turn away from you, wipe his eyes, and shut the door. And the door's going to remain shut. So it's time to get completely serious with God. All right, he's, he's the God of love, the God of the universe. He didn't only die for us, but he's wanting to embrace us with his love, you guys. He doesn't want you to have fear and confusion and all this stuff. You know, God is a God of love. He's a God of restoration. He's God, okay? And he wants to help you if you let him help you. All right, sometimes y'all have fun with people who don't know that I'm a, a teacher, a preacher of God's word, an evangelist, if you may, ordained by God himself. They'll be talking up a storm, saying all kinds of stuff. And sometimes it's good, and other times, well, <laughs> right? So I just sit there, and I listen. I listen to them and agree or disagree with what they're saying. Invariably, the conversation always turns to what I do. What do you do? What kind of work do you do? Or what do you do with your time? What have you been doing lately? Whatever. And I smile, and I say, I'm an evangelist for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a teacher and preacher of his word. So my response has different implications for the ones asking me the questions, right? You know, they have to decide now how, how they'll handle the situation. Or for some, they could care less. It doesn't bother them a bit. But it tells me a lot about them. For others, they get embarrassed and try to smooth out the situation. My answer has the implications for them. Okay, turn in your Bible to Mark 14. Let me erase this. Remember, write this verse down, y'all. Start writing this stuff down. Write this stuff down. Okay, Mark. I know 
it's 14 um, verses 55 through 65. Right there. And flip your Bibles back to Mark. It was in Revelation just now. Chapter 14. This is how you grow, y'all. This is how you grow out of fear, out of confusion. This is how you do it right here, and you stay in it. Mark 14, starting verse 55. Now the chief priests and, and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witnesses against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not, but not even then... Did their testimony agree? And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the blessed? Okay. Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of uh, witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit upon him and blindfold him and beat him and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. So in this passage of scripture, we have an answer that has implications as well. Okay, once we hear this answer, it puts us in a position where we have to respond in one way or another. Okay, it puts us in that kind of a position where you have to make a response. All right, Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. Okay, let's write this. I'm going to erase this. Let's write this out. Get your notebooks, follow along and study. You can write the verse down right there. Mark 14, 55 through 65. So what's the events that took place? Jesus betrayed, I'll put Jesus betrayed by Judas. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. All right, the arresting party had carried Jesus to the Sanhedrin. All right, they tried everything they can to get a legitimate charge against Jesus. They hate him so bad, they even get people to lie about what they've heard Jesus say. But they couldn't even get the liars to get their story straight. So the high priest turns to Jesus and asks him a direct question. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Are you? Are you, who you are they who they say you are? The answer, Jesus says, is what? I am. I am. Right here, Jesus answers, yes. Yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I'm the Son of God. I will sit at the right hand of the Father and come back one day in power. So with this statement right here, with this statement, Jesus equates himself with God. With his answer, he's saying, yes, I am God. Yes, I am God. So what an answer, right? This answer weighs a million tons. This answer changes everything, okay? Jesus has just admitted that he is God. So that answer had implications for the ones wanting to kill him, right? They dismissed Jesus' answer. They they uh, flatly rejected what he said, but the implications reach further than that group of men that's blinded by hatred. The implications reach right to this very second. What are the implications of this statement, you ask? Let me erase this right here. You think about this. Let me erase this. What are the implications of this statement? 
okay? All that we see in Jesus is revealed in God, okay? No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He's made him known, okay? Listen, no one has seen the face of God. Even though Jesus is God, I want you to understand this. I've seen Jesus as a human, as, a man, as the man he was here on this earth. He appeared to me as a human man, not in his glory. I've seen him as a very humble servant. Okay, did I see him? Yes, I was standing in front of him. I've seen him better than I've seen some of you guys. I was with him, but not in his glory. He was a humble servant. So he says in John 1 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side. He has made him known. So whoever has seen me has seen the father. Okay. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. Okay. Again, Jesus has revealed himself to some people. To me, I've seen him. Okay. But not in his glory. I've seen him as a humble serve it and to try to deny that you can't deny it because it's my experience but to try to deny that he would even appear as a humble servant is to deny him altogether because he walked this earth and we all know jesus is god he walked this earth as a humble man so he's real okay so when he appears to people he appears to us as that humble man he was on the earth but we cannot see God in his glory and live to tell about it. Okay. I did not see God in his glory on his throne or none of that. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Okay. So you want to see God? Look at Jesus. You want to see how God walks, how God talks, how God reacts? Look at Jesus. All right, what does seeing Jesus show us about God? Okay, in Mark 14, uh, 14 Matthew 9, 36, all right, we see um, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without shepherds. Okay, so he had what? He had compassion, compassion. Jesus had compassion. That means God is a compassionate God. Okay, he had compassion for those who were weary and worn out. And he had compassion for people who were wandering around without any purpose. And there, that's a lot of people, y'all, right there. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. He was, he was sorrowful. And troubled. This is Jesus, y'all. Now that's in Matthew 26, 37. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Okay, so Jesus shows us that God can be distressed by the events he sees going on. Things we do, things we don't do can distress him. Matter of fact, the Bible says he can be grieved. He can be, uh, it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. To quench him means to put him out. You hear him telling you to do something, you don't do it, eventually he'll stop telling you. To grieve the Holy Spirit means to make him sad, hurt his feelings, to hurt him. This tells you God has emotions. Okay? Uh, it says his his be, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. So Jesus shows us that God can be distressed when he sees the things that are going on. He can be grieved. He can be hurt. And immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? In Mark 2, 8. So Jesus shows us that God knows our hearts. God knows what we're thinking. He knows our motives and our goals. He knows. He's okay. And, and it says in Mark 3, 5, and he looked around at them with anger and grieved 
at their hardness of heart. So God, I told you, you can grieve him. He can feel anger. And he can feel hurt. Okay, and a lot of us do that to God. A lot of us, well, look what they did to Jesus himself. I mean, come on. So, Jesus shows us that God gets angry with our hard hearts. Hard hearts are those that refuse to turn to him and accept him. Hard hearts reject Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. When you don't spend time in studying his word, you may call yourself a Christian, okay? But you don't spend time of your day with Jesus. You and Jesus. It's a relationship, y'all. If you don't spend time with Jesus, you and him, in the word, together, together, then you don't have that relationship is in trouble, y'all. I'm going to tell you that right now. That relationship is in trouble. You know, I told you, God's word told you, the gate to destruction is very wide. But the road to heaven is real narrow because very few people want to be on the, well, they want to, but they don't do nothing to get on that road. They're not growing. You know, when you don't grow, you guys, when you don't grow in God's word, the Bible says many are going to fall away from the faith. Fall away. It could be a little sneaky trap you get let into. It could sneak up on you, you know, like a bee sting. You may not mean for that to happen, but it happens because you're not grounded and rooted in the word. You have to do it, y'all. And I'm here alive to tell you, you have to do it. Okay. Mark 8, 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? So Jesus shows us that God gets frustrated with people who will not simply believe. There's that word Jesus let me live for. You got to believe. And that doesn't mean just to know about and agree with it. That means to get in his word, study it, and do the things he tells you to do. Okay, people always want to, want to see a show or see God do something big, right? Show me what you can do and then I'll believe and follow and trust after you show me what you can do. That's what they say, say to him. When you go to John eleven thirty three, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. So this verse is, a, is a, from the passage about Lazarus. He was deeply moved about at the crying of the people because Lazarus had died. So he has feelings. He was angry at the sin that brings death to everyone. John eleven thirty five, Luke nineteen forty one says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. So Jesus cried. Write that down. He cries, y'all. I saw his tears a couple times. When I was with him, I saw his tears. He gave me a vision of America falling. I saw his tears. Okay, so Jesus shows us, y'all, that God experiences real emotions and real compassion. He wept over the city of Jerusalem because it had refused to accept him. And he wept at Lazarus' death because of his love for Lazarus and his family. Mark 10, 21, and Jesus looking at him loved him. So Jesus shows us that God loves us all, even a rich man who turns away from him. He loves us more than we can ever imagine. He looks at you every day, and he loves you. Okay? All that Jesus has said, y'all, are the words of God. John 14, 24, the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Jesus spoke the Father's words. Every word Jesus spoke is the word of God. Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So Jesus' words shows us that God expects us to die to ourself and live for him. This means forgetting all of our wants and our desires for his will for us. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus' word shows us that God's desire is that we go and tell others the good news. I talked to many people who's too scared to do it for Jesus, y'all. We can sit around and debate whether Jesus 
thinks smoking is a sin or not, right? We can sit around and debate if Jesus thinks the U.S. flag should go on the left or the right of the stage. We can sit around and debate if Jesus would go to uh, Washington and protest the Pledge of the Allegiance. We can sit around and debate whether there is a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. And the whole time, we are ignoring a sure command from Jesus, which is go, go. John 3, 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus shows, Jesus' word shows us God has declared that no one will get into heaven unless they are born again. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6. So Jesus' word tells us that he is the only way to God. He's not one of many ways, y'all, but he's the only way. All right, Jesus' answer has personal implications for us. We know God through Jesus. We know how God is. We know what God wants. We know what he did. We, we have to decide, how are we going to respond to his answer? He's the Messiah. He's God. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You got to be a doer, y'all. You got to be a doer. And you can't be a doer if you're not in his word, seeking him, finding out what he wants you to do. Okay, I'm going to show this to you one more time. Some people hear me, some don't. Some still come back with many arguments. I didn't write the book, God did. There's a very wide gate here that leads to destruction. Okay, pain eternal pain, suffering. And there's a very narrow road here, y'all, that goes to heaven, to God. Very narrow road because most people don't want to take time to get on this road. They, honest to goodness, don't want to do the work that they have to do for God. You don't work your way to heaven, y'all. You work to sanctification, okay? And you have to be sanctified to get to heaven. That's the word of God, Okay, it, it means to get on this road means to build your faith, to get saved, repent, stop doing the sins. Now build your faith, do the things God wants you to do. Start growing up into this mature, strong disciple in Jesus Christ. He wants you to be. You can't do that, y'all. If you got one foot in the world and one foot in the church or you think you're in the church, but you're not studying God's word enough. You might watch a million videos, but you're still not really studying the word you and God you're not spending time with God. People say, I don't know how to pray to God. I don't know how to talk to God. Just talk to him, y'all. Just talk to him like you would talk to me or like you would talk to your husband or wife. Just talk to him. He says, come as you are. But the fact is, come to him. All right? That road's narrow, y'all, with very few people on it. I'm trying to teach. Jesus, y'all understand this. He saved me from death 17 years ago. For this very day to teach you these very words. And he gave me a group of people to teach that I'm trying to get on this road right here. But I see some of them falling over here. And I'm trying to pull you back. God is trying to pull you back. Okay, so in the name of Jesus, start being a doer for Jesus Christ. All right. If you don't know Jesus, ask him to save you. And now become a doer of his word. All right. God bless each one of you. I'm sure I'll be back in a little bit. I got to do more studies. God is on the roll with me. The Holy Spirit's heavy today, y'all. Very heavy. So there's more lessons to come. Stay up. I spend my time in God's word, y'all. And I'm begging you to do the same thing. In the name of Jesus. All right. Anything else you need to know is in the description. God bless each one of you.